Rolling. Two. Eight. Five. <laughs> ah, brilliant. <laughs> Why can't you work that? Have you broken it? Charlotte. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale. Look. What? Look at see what that says there. What does it say? It says the Jerry Anderson podcast. Gosh, that's very impressive reading you've got going on there. That must be why we're here. I guess so. We've been conjured into existence for another <laughs> thrilling episode of yeah. the Jerry Anderson podcast. What were you doing before you were... Con- I was in my kitchen making some pasties. Uh, I was taking Rodri for a walk. Who's Rodri? <laughs> <laughs> Roger's Have my, I met him? Roger's my dog. Oh. He's my, my wolfhound puppy. Yeah, right. Okay. Who's been, enormous. Been, we've been sort of, a, you know, time scooped. Oh, we have been. Yes. Actually, what I should have said I was doing, I was in the rose garden smelling some roses and I looked up and there was this... Another version of the time scoop. Of course. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Doctor Who. No. Well, let's hope that Chris isn't trapped in a small glass prism. Oh, yes. Chris Dale, you mean? Yes. He's here for the randomizer a little later on. Will be, yes. There he is. Hi, no, Chris. Oh, Hi he's over there. Look, he, he's fine. Oh, he's tucking into a nice bit of pineapple there, I see. Oh, yes. Sweet. Lovely. Mm. Devouring uh, it in a rather disgusting way, actually. Isn't he? Uh, now, so Chris Dale, we've mentioned. Brilliant. But who are you? Uh, Jamie Anderson. You're Jamie Anderson. Mm. I see. And, and you? I think I'm still Richard James. I thought we booked Lou Hirsch for this one. Never mind. Good luck with that. Yeah, no, that's never going to happen, is it? I would love to get Lou Hirsch on. It's not going to happen. He's stateside now. It's not going to happen. But he could do it remotely. We could have Lou on the big screen. I mean, we would have to cut it to shreds. His interview would literally be, hi, Lou. Bye, Lou. That would be it. Everything else would have to be cut. Because expletives, you know. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun. Let's, <laughs> let's see if we can make it happen. Anyway, uh, mm. that is a sort of hint to the fact that every week on the Jerry Anderson podcast, we yep. have a guest. We do! Yeah. And this week's guest yep. is the same as last week's guest, <laughs> yeah, because right. we do these things in two parts. It's yes. Craig Morris from ITVX. Yes, that's right. Exactly. Uh, the man who brought us Jerry Anderson on ITVX, essentially. Pretty much, yeah. Without whom, and so on and I, so forth. I think that's probably fair to say. Wow. Great. Well, we'll find out more in the second part of your interview with Craig a little later on. Yes. Gosh, let's hope I don't mess that one up. <laughs> Again. Uh, uh, yes, we also have, of course, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's... Uh, I can't even, bring my, can't even bring myself to say it. <laughs> oh, I know. <clears throat> Fab facts, that is, that uh, is the favourite thing in your life. Yeah, yes. do you know what? I actually don't even mind it. I don't know why we've got this running gag that I hate it. Yeah. It's quite fun sometimes. There you go. Uh, but more importantly than that, our podstrons, yes. podcast at jerryanderson.com, sending yes. in emails. Facebook I group. read some out, you read some out. YouTube channel, uh, yes. official Jerry Anderson. People comment underneath. I read them out, you read them out. Full uh, sentences, <laughs> possible, no. <laughs> Not doing those? Right. It's quite a packed podcast when you think about it, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's not just us kind of chuntering on for I an hour I think it could half. probably be an hour if we didn't chunter. <laughs> a lot of chuntering. Do you think people scrub past the chuntering? Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You know, underneath, where, on YouTube particularly, and uh, when I put the, you know, the chapter headings, as yeah. it were, I might just put, you know, 00 dot dot 27 to 04 dot dot 38. Chuntering. Yeah, I think that's... So people know they could just skip over it. Yeah. I Good. bet they're not even listening now. No. I know I bother. Anyway, should we just do Fab Facts? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. It's Fab Facts! Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. And now, Fab Facts. Nice. Yes. Hmm? So we we don't need to gag this week about how you really hate it because no. you find it tolerable or yeah. sometimes interesting I've only been joking all these years really it has been years hasn't gosh it? you've been really holding on to that for a long time anyway you all know the drill yep. look at fab facts flick through it shouts yep. fab I say things that's interesting probably yeah good ready luck. yeah good here we go fab very nice thank you oh what? I actually slightly lost my thumbing there. But, oh, did uh, you? Yeah. yeah. Funny that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's interesting how that's... <laughs> I don't that know how that me. keeps happening. I know. Yeah. Must do something about this thumb. Must be faulty. Okay. A faulty thumb. Needs an MOT or something. Okay. Anyway, um, the fab fact for this podcast... Yes. <laughs> ...goes as slow as follows. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> I know discussion. you're aware of this. Chris is aware of this. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, uh, and some listeners may be aware that Anderson Entertainment has recently become uh, involved... Very lightly with yes. the, um, Hammer Films. Oh yes, rather exciting. Yes, uh, we've worked um, with the the team on the latest Hammer release, Doctor Jekyll. Yes, uh, a Hammer for those of you who don't know, 
And what? And there's people who won't know what hammer is. Really? Absolutely, I think. But it was ubiquitous. It, what? Well, that's ah. the was. You see, and I think it has fallen out of ubiquity. ubiquity. <laughs> well, that's a great sentence, isn't it? Yes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and you're completely forgiven for not knowing, uh, it was a film company most famous for producing a string of classic British horror films oh, yeah. from the mid 1950s to the mid 1970s. Too right. Uh, such oh, as oh, I mean Dracula, obviously, and then yeah. and the various sequels. Ghost, Ghost of the Baskervilles, how the ba- yeah, oh. Oh. Plague of the Zombies. Oh yes, yeah. yes. anyway, uh, but it wasn't just horror films that Hammer produced, even though that's what they're most known for. Uh-huh. Uh, founded in 1934, they also produced war films, crime films, comedies, swashbucklers. Sorry, so, they were founded in 1934. Yes. God, I just had no their 90th idea. birthday. Well, well, yeah, go on, swashbucklers, um, yeah, swashbucklers, mm. sci-fi, oh. and more. Mm. And in 1969, Good they idea. produced the first space western. Oh, mm. I like the sound of that. Are you, tr- you trying to think of a portmanteau for it? A spesten? Spesten? No, it doesn't sound very good, does it? Mm. Sounds like fibres you find in the ceiling. <laughs> it's not that. Anyway, it was a space western. It was a sci-fi film uh, called Moon Zero Two. Do you know oh, of it? I don't know. Okay, well, set in the distant future of 2021. <laughs> right. So <laughs> now in the recent the recent past, past, past yeah, yes. Okay. The film focused on a space pilot played by James Olsen, who is approached by a young lady whose brother... A moon miner, with an E, oh, miner, right. yes. not minor, sure. uh, has gone missing. Said young lady was played by future Space 1999 star, Catherine Schell. Oh! So yes, H- uh, Hammer got Catherine Schell to the moon first, not the Andersons. Well, well. Now, did she mention this in her interview? Do you know what? I don't think she did. All those months ago, years that was ago. years ago. Yeah. I did record that in, the, in, in lockdown, right, I think. Okay. So, no, I don't oh. remember. But maybe go back and have a listen yeah. if you want to hear more. Yeah, you're right. Uh, also on the cast were UFO guest actress uh, Adrienne Corrie. Right. Uh, and Neil McCallum, who mm. pr- provided voices in Thunderbirds Argo and four episodes of Captain Scarlet mm. and played guest roles in UFO and The Protectors. <sighs> it's such a small world of, a small pool of actors doing all yes, these things, isn't it? Yes. Also in the film were such notable actors uh, as Warren Mitchell, yeah. 1960s Doctor Who villains uh, Bernard Breslau and oh, Dudley yeah. Foster, Monty Python's Carol Cleveland, yeah. Michael Ripper, who appeared in more Hammer films than any other actor, oh, yeah. and Sam Kidd, who appeared in more British films than any other actor. That's quite really? a claim to fame, yeah. More British films than any other actor? That's what it says here. It must be official. All those carry-ons that they all did. It must and... be real, yeah. Well. There you go. Uh... Familiar Anderson names among the crew also included Brian Johnson Mm -hmm. and Nick Alder in the special effects department, Mm -hmm. stuntman Martin Grace, and sound recordist Claude Hitchcock. Mm. There you go. Yeah, nice. Uh, However, for this fab fact, this bit we've had so far (laughs) is not the fab fact. We're going to focus not on a person, (laughs) but on a particular prop. This is much more like a fab fact, don't you agree? I feel that this could have been two fab facts and we could have spread this over a fortnight. Well... But there we There's are. no no I chance mean, now. Yeah, that's right. We're focusing on a particular prop mm-hmm. from Moon Zero Two. Mm-hmm. Uh, can I also add before we get to the prop? Yeah, that there is a little nod, in a way, yeah. to another Anderson show. Uh, yeah, costume it, element in what in the in the uh, Moon Zero Two? Yeah, right. Catherine Shell. Yes, pink wig. Oh, you really brightly coloured wigs. Yeah. Ah. I don't know whether UFO came first or not. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, probably they the were in time, production earlier, yeah. Well, well. Maybe UFO stole it. Anyway, let's not get into that. Uh, we mentioned before, mm-hmm. moving on, mm-hmm. that the spacesuits from Doppelganger had a long afterlife, including becoming the shadow spacesuits in UFO, as well as many appearances in other shows and films. Right. But so did the spacesuits from Moon Zero Two. Right. For instance, mm. the complete suit with helmet turned up in an episode of Here Come the Double Deckers. Oh, I remember that. Not one I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but sometimes just the helmets were used, for instance, as the helmets of the three alien ambassadors in Doctor Who, the ambassadors, ambassadors of, of death. death. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ambassadors makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but oh, right. I hear you cry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> with all this mixing and matching going on, did any part of the Moon Zero Two spacesuits and the doppelganger UFO spacesuits ever appear together on screen? Oh, is there an answer to that, or is that a rhetorical question? No, that's what they were crying, but yes. Oh, I see. Well, I've got the answer. Oh, right, okay. They did. <laughs> right, 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 good. That's good. And yes. in a later Anderson production as well, that's where they appeared. Okay. Specifically, the Space 1999 episode, Mission of the Darians, in a scene where Koning and Bergman are stunned by two space-suited Darian guards. Right. One of the guards is wearing an old shadow spacesuit helmet, and the other 
helmet comes from Moon Zero Two. Okay. Both of them have been resprayed the same colour, but if you look closely, you can spot the various differences that indicate which production they were first used in. Right. So. Right. Oh, well, this, so, yes. There you go. Oh. Uh, that's the Anderson connection to the 1969 Hammer production Moon Zero Two, a movie that TV Zone magazine once described as watchable. I, I'd take that. High praise indeed. I would absolutely take that. Watchable, that's fine by me. There we are. I mean, I know Fab Facts, the book you have there, is a sacred tome. It is. But let's hypothetically imagine that someone each week had to prepare those Fab Facts for a podcast. Do you think they might be kicking themselves now that that was a a, a, a Fab Fact that probably could have lasted three or four weeks? They could have divided it up and had a month's worth. I mean, they would be probably kicking themselves. But, of course, that hasn't (laughs) happened because this is a book that's been pre-written that we pull facts from at random. Yeah, that's right. Yes, exactly Yeah. Uh, On a similar note, do you Mm. remember a few weeks ago we mentioned uh, the inspiration for Brains as part of a a fab fact? Yes. The uh, the scientist from Horizon documentary. Someone rather pertinently, I think, wrote beneath uh, the podcast on YouTube that uh, they wondered how we'd managed to get the pictures up so quickly if Ah. the fab was random. Well. I mean, editing. Yes. Well, it's a combination of editing and also your favourite member of the podcast team. Oh, I've lost count now. Well, one of them, who very quickly runs along yeah. and does a search and Scurries then puts them up on the screen. That'll be, that'll be Ross. Yeah, it's Ross. That's right. I mean, Chris doesn't scurry about. <laughs> no, I've never seen that. He just sits on his sofa I know. <laughs> Coming up later with the randomizer. Uh, great, yeah. Well, that was certainly a prolific, prodigious <laughs> fab fact, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, what? Okay, go on. I'm not sure we're going to end this one. Um, so, Podsterons, have you seen any other strange combinations of Anderson costumes combined with non-Anderson costumes that turn up in an Anderson or non-Anderson production? We'd love to know. Do email us podcast at jerryanderson.com. I don't think we're going to get any emails about that. No. Anyway, that brings us very strangely, <laughs> no idea where we're going to go with this one, to the end of this week's... Costumes that may or may not have ended up on a Jerry Anderson or non Jerry Anderson related series. Fact! Fact. Yeah, space suit would have been easier. It would, wouldn't it? Brilliant. Good. Why didn't I think of that? That went so well. It was good. No, that. uh, What I love about the Fab Facts. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) It's so very varied, isn't it? It's very varied. Sometimes you get one that's very long, sometimes Mm. you get one a little more concise. Yeah. But the long ones are sometimes good and sometimes I, I don't know what the hell's going on. Talking of long ones. Yes. Now, let's look at our email bag. Okay. It's time to open the door and let in the Podstrons because it's a bit of a talking prodigious size. Is it bulging? What, oh, what a length. Okay. Never mind the length. Look at the girth. Okay. Let's, let's do it. Let's open the door. This is the voice of the Podstrons. Oh, it is nice, actually, isn't it, when we get to this point and we can just chill out the pod, the voice of the podstrons. It kind of just sets us up nicely, doesn't it? Do you feel it? chilled out? I do. I feel relaxed and chilled, yeah. Mm. Uh, now, do you want me to take the longer one or or, or, or vice versa? I well, don't mind. Where is the the second one in? You made me do the long one Fair last enough. time. All right. So, so I think it's your turn. Okay, I'll so start I'll... with this one from Scott Bickley. No, because no, the what? long one's next, isn't it? No, it's the second one I've said. Oh, I see. So you So I take the first one. I'm very easily confused. Oh, clearly. Anyway, Scott has written in a relatively short email. Yes. It says, hello, Jamie and Richard, and I mustn't forget Chris too. Uh, no, how okay, could Chris. you? Much better than Chris 1, I think. How is everyone? Um, better. Good. You? Um, yeah, I'm all right. Chris? <laughs> oh, so, so, says Chris. There we go. Uh, Scott continues. Hmm. When I watched Pod 277 with Genevieve Gaunt answering my question on her interview... Yeah. I was thrilled. Oh, good. Yes, the greatest franchise of all time I asked her about was indeed Thunderbirds, as I grew up uh, on it more than some of the others that I do enjoy watching. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah. To answer Genevieve's question oh? about my last name. Bikliki. Bikliki. Yes, yes. A question it's... I've never thought to ask Scott before. Well, I've met I mean, him. I love that the questions are now going both ways. <laughs> yeah. This is fantastic. That's right. Bikliki is from Scott's dad's side of the family, as he was from Kosovo. Ah. Oh. There you go. His English is good, but his spelling is not. <laughs> right, okay. Great. Uh, when will the Thunderbirds audio CD set Danger and Deception be released, as I have it pre-ordered? I'm looking forward to listening to it. Oh, yeah. Thank you for making such a f- uh, f- an f a b u l e s fabulous. <laughs> That's the spelling as we went to say, right? That's an f a b u l e s podcast. Say, yeah. uh, here's to many more to come. Aww, Take yes. care. Have a great day. Well, oh, just the day, though. We'll do. Just F-A-B, the day. Scott. Thanks. Uh, Danger and Deception should be uh, end of November, mm-hmm. I believe. So very mm-hmm. soon, like the next two weeks. Great. Exciting. Good. Right. I mean, your turn. Oh, sorry. You wanted to No, just before. Is there any other podcast where the listeners and viewers actually have the opportunity to ask that the special guests that week questions? 
I wonder. I don't know. Because I think there might be a bit of a USP for us. One of our USPs, yes. In case you don't know, <laughs> in case you don't know, uh, on our Facebook group, uh, every now and then, mm. I mention who our next guest is, mm, and do. I open the door to, to questions from our podstrons, and you just comment beneath and put your questions, and there you go into the Space 1999 lunchbox. <coughs> Yes, and if you're listening to this for the first time, this whole thing must be a very weird experience. Yeah. Anyway. Here's a long one. This is from Sook Deep, who says... Good luck. Ready? Mm. Dear Richard and Jamie, greetings to you both. Greetings. Uh, I've been an avid listener of the podcast for many months now, and I really enjoy it. But ah. this is the first time I'm writing in. Uh, I've so much to say... Obviously, you'll see. Uh, much of which has already been said by other listeners and special guests on your show. I wanted to share my thoughts on Jerry's work and what it means to me. Great. Well, well we like hearing these yeah. things. Now, my earliest memory was watching Stingray on BBC. This would have been in the early 1980s. Sweet. Okay. Uh, the episode featured Stingray in a fish tank. It's not until recently when I spoke about this memory at our Podstron Zoom meeting over on Facebook Lovely. that the podders confirmed that the episode was Tom Thumb Tempest and it wasn't a figment of my imagination. <laughs> yeah, it's funny when that happens. A few years later, Stingray was being repeated again and I recall watching the Pink Ice episode, which I managed to tape on VHS. Sometime after that, Thunderbirds was rerun during 1992-93 and this rerun caught my imagination as well as all my school friends. Uh, we would discuss the episodes at school with great excitement. I was fascinated by the big production, big budget, cinematic quality of Thunderbirds. Isn't it amazing? Even at that young age, that's what you uh, still caught attention. Absolutely. Uh, after the Thunderbirds rerun came to an end in '93, the BBC began their rerun of Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, and this is where I was hooked. Ah, uh, growing up with um, perfect. There was something about the original Captain Scarlet which completely fascinated me. The cinematic quality and big budget production values were all a given and impressive as always. But this time, the screenplay and cinema photography was more fluid. The characters had just the right amount of uh, level of development, so to leave enough room for your imagination to fill in the gaps. Gosh. Interesting. So a step up in terms of storytelling and scripting, I suppose, there, between well, the I, earlier ones and, and Scarlet. Certainly more grown up, right? That's why I said he grew up yeah. in parallel with these things being re-shown. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, over the course of the series, I saw Spectrum battle it out with the Mistrons. As with other Anderson productions, what I found most endearing were the forces of good. Spectrum, International Rescue, etc. were organised and fully equipped. The formula Hollywood narrative was smashed by Jerry Anderson. Traditionally, the forces of evil would dominate for three quarters of the length of the, of the production, while the forces of good were caught on the back foot, disorganised or in denial. Instead, we saw the forces of good were already organised and fully equipped with hardware and technology and ready to act. You can see the military strategic thinking of Colonel White when his first action almost always is launch all angels. Mm. Meanwhile, he, uh, meaning that he wants air superiority over the area, he would then send ground troops in by deploying Captains Blue and Scarlet, etc. And much of this detail is only now being appreciated as many of us have revisited these productions during lockdown. Ah. I think many people did, didn't they? Yes. Because it was what a strange time. Well, yes, and also, you know, we look back to safer times, don't we, during yes. moments of danger. Seeking nostalgic warmth and security. Exactly. <laughs> After many years of neglect, it was during lockdown that I dusted off my Captain Scarlet box set and began to watch an episode each evening. The unseen threat of COVID coupled with trying to cope with lockdown, for me, correlated to the threat of the Mistrons. Oh. I found that whenever I faced adversity or tragedy in my life, I've turned to original Captain Scarlet for comfort, inspiration and a form of escapism. Much has been written regarding Jerry Anderson's utopian worlds which he created in his shows. Much has also been written and said previous regarding the cloud base, the angels of Colonel White as Celestial representations. Interesting take. Mm. Uh, these I would not disagree with. Sometimes it's not what the artist's intention is that is important, but what you make of it and what it gives Absolutely. you. Absolutely. That's... I I'm all totally with you there. So you can make of it what you will. That's yep. interesting, isn't it? All things to everyone. Uh, I have so much more to say, but I'll keep it to my next email. Another long one to look forward <laughs> to. That's right. I wanted to thank you both for all your wonderful work and for keeping my spirits up during the dark days of lockdown. Through your podcast, I discovered the wonderful Podstrons group and their weekly Zoom meetings are a vital part of my life. Oh. Kindest regards, Sukti. S-I-G. Lovely. How lovely. See, it's worth reading, isn't it? Yes. One person's experience of how they came across uh, Jerry Anderson and his work and what it means to them, mm. always worth hearing. It's yeah. Lovely. Because it's always different for someone else's. Yeah, these lovely converging and diverging threads yeah. where people, you know, they've got different angles and things. And yeah. Yeah. Nice. Lovely. Thanks for that. Do send it. I, I look forward to hearing the next one. You can read out the next one. All right, fine. Deal. Oh, well, no, it was a good one. <laughs> it was lovely, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Uh, is there more? Yeah, one more, I think. Oh, oh, it's a medium one. Right, so can you cope with that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, go on. Uh, it's Mark Perkins. Obviously. He's quite a regular. Yeah, we love it. Emailer. Yeah. yeah. 
Greetings, podcasts. There you go. Says Mark. That's a standard Mark intro, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, some might say I have a little too much time on my hands. Well, but, <laughs> not saying know, that. But, but as we head into winter, I like to have a plan of which shows I'm going to watch with my breakfast oh. over the coming few weeks and months. Right. Gosh, TV at breakfast. Oh, I used to, well, that's, that feels very uh, sort of childhoody to me. Instantly, I'm, in, I'm taken back to Toast and Marmalade and Inspector Gadget, for example. That's oh, but my... you're talking weekends, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Not, I mean, you wouldn't be allowed TV during the week. Not, not before school, no. no. <laughs> Parents weren't monsters. Uh, as I think I've mentioned before, uh, I run my own version of The Randomizer. Chris's isn't good enough, clearly. So that every morning I can settle down to watch something from the Andiverse uh, in the, the precious times before the rest of the household get up and I can actually have control of the TV. Yeah. Currently, I'm branching out to include some recent acquisitions, which now include Space Patrol. Ah, right. Mm. Okay. I like to think of it as an Anderson show from an alternate universe where Jerry carried on working with Arthur Provis and Roberta Lee um, and had none of Lou Great's money. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, there'd be other That's stuff that it. was lacking in that universe, obviously. Um, this morning, I watched one of the later episodes, Deadly Whirlwind. Oh, great God. name. I've had a few of them Which myself. Which is superb. Oh, superb. Sounds like that curry dish we had that time we went The out Deadly Whirlwind here, yeah. or super, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the story moves at a breathtaking pace, features a race against time to save the Earth from two separate existential threats, has some very funny dialogue, and is all accompanied by the most unusual and innovative electronic music. Hmm. None of it looks as sophisticated as Viable XL5, and the voice acting takes a while to get used to, but I love the show. Right. That's great, right. isn't it? Yeah. It's such good news that the Blu-ray release has now been rescued through Anton Entertainment, we're very happy to do so, since the devastating demise of Network, and I'd encourage anyone wanting to experience some alternative space puppet adventures from the 1960s to get to know Captain Larry Dart, and the crew of Gallosphere 347. Oh. There you go. Well. rays on. Mark Perkins, that's their Fair enough. phrase from the Is show. it? What does yeah. that mean? rays. It's a thing they've got. Like okay. a technology. Is it? Yeah. Are there any other sort of properties that you'd want to bring into the uh, kind of Anderson stable, do you think, <laughs> that are kind of near cousins that you I think don't might know. be? I mean, there's, there are things like um, Starfleet and yes. all that sort of stuff. Yes. And uh, what's the... There's a South African puppet show that I now can't think of the name of. I'm waiting for the randomizer to call it out. Interstellar. Interstellar, yeah, which kind of feel Anderson adjacent, right? right? Okay. Um, obviously, Thunderbirds twenty eighty six. That's another yeah. one. That's, yeah. So there's lots of stuff that, yeah. that that are Anderson adjacent, and yeah. I think could live kind of within the Anderson universe. Yes, but uh, many, many hurdles to overcome before getting those. many rivers to cross. Yes, yes. great, uh, excellent. Uh, do keep them coming in podcast at jerryanderson dot com. Uh, we love to get your emails. We just love the fact that you're still listening and watching after all these mm. years. Some of us have been with us. Some of them rather have been with us since the beginning. They have. And Amazing. some just recently. And Maybe some even gave some up just, just today. Well, they won't be here, will they? Uh, yeah, we can be really rude about them, can't we? Let's not. Let's oh, not right, do that. Right. Let's, let's keep them entertained with something new. A guest interview. Ah, uh, yes. But we know who it is. Who is it? Well, you're going to tell us. What now? Yeah. All right. Come on. It's time to welcome back the managing editor of ITVX, the home to all things Anderson and more besides. He's been an Anderson fan forever, and even holds the distinction of previously meeting not only the great Jerry Anderson himself, but also the lesser Jamie Anderson. Despite that, he's decided to join us again to tell us more about his work and Anderson memories. It's Craig Morris! Welcome back, Craig. That's all right. Loved it so much. I couldn't wait to get back. We couldn't lock you out. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, you, you are, I'm going to call you Mr. ITVX because you're giving them the kind of editorial direction. Yes. And you are kind of setting the tone for what should be there. And therefore, we've yeah. got you to thank for all the Anderson content that is there. And your colleagues, obviously, have mm. been so brilliant and supportive. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I was going to say. There's a big team there, but you, you set a strategy. But I think both at BritBox and at ITVX, we've got an amazing acquisitions team, actually. who are very good when you go, we need a bit more of this or a bit more of that. And they, they're the people who go out, they do the deals, and they, they manage to pull all of this together, mm. which is amazing so yeah i don't want to take all the glory for it but uh well i'm i'm giving you gonna give it. It. i'll walk around yeah. with a badge so yeah we'll get you a badge for that ITVX. so we last week we discussed how uh, ricochet um inspired mm. you to go into radio mm. so i mean could you give me your kind of comic book superhero origin story from radio to itvx and a few of the kind of highlights along the way in a in a one to two minute version yeah yeah um listen i mean Although, here's, here's the honest truth. I loved radio because I love 
music. And at the time, you know, there was a lot of radio stations all over the country. So there was always one up the road. So it was sort of easier to get into radio. But t- TV was the ultimate love. Mm. Um, before radio, during radio. And I would... I would get Broadcast Magazine to just see the overnights and see all the industry gossip. And during my radio years, I ended up doing TV continuity uh, for ITV, for Anglia Television in the 90s. And um, that got me a bit closer, you know. And so just bit by bit, you you know, my path was crossing more and more with TV. Um, But I loved radio. I did 10 years on the radio, 10 years then um, in management. But I, I was sort of, I was coming up on 20 years and I remember thinking, but do I just want to keep doing this or do I try and go and scratch that TV itch? I'd love to work in TV. And I just got really lucky, actually. I started talking to somebody at the BBC just at the point when they were setting up their high definition TV channel. And they sort of needed somebody to come in and effectively sort of gather together all the HD programmes that were being made for the different channels and put them into one HD channel called BBC HD. And I think I'd contacted them at just the right time because Christmas was coming, everybody was really busy, and it was a bit of an add-on. It was a bit of a, who's going to do BBC HD? Probably not many people watching it. But it got me in the door, and I hadn't been there long, and then they went, we want to do more on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. We need somebody embedded within the channels to advise what we do, and we would do deals with people like Mock the Week and... Uh, the Jonathan Ross uh, chat show at the time to clip up bits and put them out on the YouTube channel. So I was very much in the new bit of the BBC. I wasn't on the traditional linear channels to start with. Anyway, that led to uh, doing a scheduling role on BBC Two for a year. Someone went on mat leave. And I love that because that got me in content, uh, into contact, if you like, with uh, archive um, content on TV. This is years after they brought back Thunderbirds and a lot of the Jerry yeah. Anderson properties, they still had a budget to do classic TV. So I, I could finally get my hands on the BBC archive and <laughs> bring some of it and put it on, on the TV. Yeah. Um, so, for example, they would play a bit of Dad's Army at Christmas, but I started showing it every Saturday night at half seven. And I remember they let me do it as a trial and went, but I, I'm not sure, you know, we'd do it more than a month. And I think they carried on for over 10 years. I was only there on BBC Two for that year. So I just, there was always this thread of archive. So I loved radio, but running through it all was this kind of love of TV. And I think once I'd got my foot in the door, then they they weren't getting rid of me. I wanted to be involved. So I did um, BBC Two. Then I went off uh, to work. Well, there was various companies owned them, but for Channel 5 and Viacom and Paramount. And I launched a lot of their channels in the UK. And I used to oversee all the the sort of scheduling and planning for Channel 5. So uh, I did that for many years. And then I wanted to get into streaming and BritBox was my route into streaming because I could bring all that knowledge of, of TV, commercial TV, and almost a bit of the radio spirit of this quite a small startup mentality, sort of coming up with creative ideas and bringing it to life with a small team, which wasn't very TV, actually. So I probably pulled on my radio experience there. So that that's how it, that's how it went, really. Radio to TV, then into streaming via BritBox. Amazing. And here we are. Now, the, the nice thing is, I just realised during that, is you putting Dad's Army on then means you're responsible for actually some of the very limited time that I spent sitting with Dad watching TV. Really? Growing up, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, You'd that would be right. Because it, it sort of, it was loved by the BBC, but I still think they saw it as something to do on special occasions. And yeah. I remember saying to them when I was there, there was still quite a few of the cast alive. And it's like, I wonder whether it makes sense to get them all together I think I'd read somewhere that Jonathan Ross was a bit of a super fan. And I remember suggesting when I was at the BBC, is it worth doing? And and they did it. And as a fan growing up of all of these shows, to be able to suggest things and see these things come together, I felt a very similar thing um, with the Gerry Anderson doc, A Life Uncharted, to have any kind of part in something that that celebrated Gerry and his legacy was really special to me. Because, you know, these are shows you you know, you sort of cling on to as you grow up and they, they're they quite, you know, they go quite deep with mm. you. So one of the lovely things about being a fan of TV, working in TV, is when you can bring it together like that. And yeah, Dad's Army was lovely. And I would see the cast in interviews saying, oh yeah, and it's back on a, it's back every Saturday night now. And it was quite simple. I had a lot of history shows on a Saturday night. Mm. I loved Dad's Army. 
And I was looking for a show that would just get a big audience through the door at the beginning of the evening. And so I suddenly thought, hang on, Dad's Army at half seven and uh, Time Watch at eight. Mm. There's, a, there's a sort of history element there. Should bring in an older upmarket audience against, you know, whatever it is, Strictly. Um, and, and yeah, it worked. There you go. Great. Well, I would watch that with Dad and uh, lots oh, of happy that's, hours. That, that's lovely. That's a lovely know, full yeah. circle. Yeah, there, which is great. I love that. Love that. Uh, now, last week we looked at the moment that inspired you and your first Anderson memory and that started that radio journey. This week, I think we should look at your favourite moment. So, shall we watch the screen and then you can tell us all about yes, it? Yes, definitely. <laughs> landing stage built for emergencies with an underground passageway from the house. Where is it then? Mr. Lopez never told me. He told only one other. But he is now dead. You mean Culp? Yes, Culp. Oh! Come on, we've got to get out of here. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> who else at that time was doing that on this type of TV shows? I mean, you know, that's the Jurassic Park of its day. You know, it you is. Look at that. Yeah. And, and, and I think I love that scene because it sort of brings everything together. There was always a lot of ambition in Anderson. Um, but parking the fact, and I think I only realised this when I was a lot older, that if they were to scale, they would be enormous, wouldn't they, those alligators? They were the size of a window. They would stuff, be, but, yes, know. absolutely um, vast. Parking that one as a kid, you know, when you're just at home watching that on TV, it's it's exciting and it's gripping. And it's the storytelling, it's the characters, the storytelling, but these amazing ambitious visuals and things that, that the team did, and it was a team effort, I know. It, you know, you look at that and go, you know, as that lab is being smashed up and stuff, oh, yeah. it's proper exciting TV, isn't it? It is. I, I actually, uh, my cheeks slightly ache from smiling at that because it, it, there is something really magical about it. And, yeah. and now in HD, yes. seeing it like that, and even stuff like the, the scale of the grass versus the alligators yes yeah. just there's just so much detail in it oh it's it's just beautifully done yeah and i think it sums up a lot of the care and attention that the teams used to put in to these shows particularly the design aesthetic and mm. the set building and as i said everything you, you know i mean i've watched a lot of tv from that era and uh, it's quite basic in comparison mm. Um, and thank God it was all shot on film as well. So we still get to see it, as you say, looking better than ever. Yeah, no, it looks absolutely amazing. I mean, it's there's, there's so many aspects to that which now wouldn't happen for a kid's show. I mean, let alone talking about a character being mm. dead, yes, uh, yeah. which would be avoided now and all the kind mm. of violence and destruction that comes with that. It, is, do you think that's part of the, the reason that it kind of has been so timeless and survives on the streaming services? And does it really, do the shows like, like Thunderbirds and Beyond have a place in a, a modern streaming landscape when there's so many thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of hours of content, it, does it still have a place and why are people are watching it? Yeah, definitely. Look, I think um, it taps into that thing. There's not many shows that are aimed at a, a family audience or a kid's audience translate, but I can think of a few. I think the Muppets do it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Disney tapped into something that adults could watch and kids could watch. Um, at Doctor Who. And, and I'd, I'd say the Jerry Anderson stuff, that, that world. And I think it's made, it's so good, you can watch it as an adult and appreciate mm. it and love it. And we've all done this. You go back to other kids' shows and they just, they, they're kids' shows. They don't really sue. I think it's quite timeless because it's just a, a, a sort of ripping good adventure. And that whole thing about people dying, I think there's, you know, there's not many shows that do that. Again, they're, they're, I, I saw it in the Jerry Anderson shows and I probably saw it in Doctor Who, um, but no, not really anywhere else. And that's an interesting point, actually. I mean... 
times change and, you know, we've got Grange Hill on Britbox and people often ask me, why do you put all the older kids stuff almost... You, you put it into BritBox as an adult thing and you don't put it because we have kids content in ITVS. Why don't you put it in the kids stuff? And it's like, because if you go back and rewatch it, what was suitable for kids 40 years ago, it's not suitable now. I mean, in Grange Hill, Alan, in the early days, he's puffing on a real cigarette around the back of the school. <laughs> you know, it's quite shocking to watch a kid smoking yeah. on, a, on a drama. Um, so times change, you know, and a lot of it wouldn't be suitable. Um I think these are timeless. I think very cleverly, um, Jerry, Sylvia, the, the the whole production team, they set these adventures in a world. They they made a very wise choice, which is that the future in 30, 40, 50 years' time is not all going to be silver and sliding doors. There's actually still going to be elements of buildings and real life in there as we know it today. Yeah. They're not just going to bulldoze it all in a couple of decades. And so weirdly, it's quite timeless. There's a lot of references and images that still still look all right. And I I don't know, that maybe it was just fortuitous. A lot of this happened during the 60s and that 60s style aesthetic has, has kind of lingered and carried on. Yeah. So you see people in in an episode of one of these shows and you think, yeah, they could they could still probably dress like that now and they'd still fit in so many other shows you know put people in silly silver suits or whatever yeah and, do you know what i mean so so there's a timeless nature to it but i think the, the trick is real good family viewing is parents and kids watching something and um and i think all of these shows uh, have that quite often three generation viewing i think so yes that's, that's quite yes. something isn't it yes absolutely absolutely that so so yeah so it's 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 exciting for me that they're reborn and it's that every it feels like every 20 or 30 years like there was a moment in the 90s and there's been another moment recently in streaming that that um these shows get reborn again Long may it continue. Uh, Craig, we've got some podster on questions for you. In the mighty lunchbox. In the lunchbox of doom. Uh, no, no, not doom <laughs> at all. It, last week it was the lunchbox of potential negotiation. Yes. Um, yeah, there was a lot of business questions, which I'm sure you planted in there. <laughs> I, did, no, I no, promise. No, There's no planting going on here, no. I assure you. Well, this is from uh, Simpsons Clips. Yes, indeed. And it says, are you planning on having Lavender Castle on ITVX? Now... Um, you're, you're probably an expert in this, but when you try and track down the rights for all these shows, it's quite a patchwork, isn't it? And some it are easier than others. And I, I, I think you probably told me this, but Lavender Castle is tied up with one of the trickiest rights holders you could get. Yes, it's, it's, it's an interesting way it's to dream, describe It's them. DreamWorks, isn't it? It is DreamWorks. Which is a very big company. And yes. so suddenly trying to get a very big company with millions of priorities to focus in on something like this is a little harder. Um, so for rights reasons, I think that's, you know, that's not going to be possible anytime soon is my gut. It's feel. a very tricky ask. I think the only way we could do that is, is if there was a, a bigger deal for... 50, 100 titles out of DreamWorks, which I guess is yeah. probably not on your priorities list. No, right now. no. And they are a company we do business with, but yeah, not on that scale. Yeah. So look, we'll always look for opportunities. Yeah. We'll always ask. Um, so I'll definitely take that away. But that is harder to unlock, definitely, tricky. than some of the others. Yeah. Sorry, Simpsons Clips. Sorry. Uh, let's pick another one. Okay. Move on from that slightly sad yeah, answer sorry, to a happier yeah. one, we yeah. hope. Is this happier? Well, this is from Gary Hodgkinson. And he said um, he was banned too from watching Space 99 as a youngster. In which case, Craig, <laughs> if he was banned too, what, were you banned from watching Space 1999? Well, Gary was banned as a youngster for being naughty, but only for a few episodes. So it sounds like it was more of a punishment. I was banned from watching it because this is the honest truth. So in the 80s, uh, as I say, I used to live up near Manchester. Um, Granada used to repeat Space 1999 on a Sunday lunchtime, which is perfect, right? And, Ideal. And until my parents decided we were going to do the whole, we're going to have a roast dinner and we're all going to sit together and it's family time. And I would have moaned and bleated because it started to creep into my Space 1999 watching time. Um, and, and, you know, some of those episodes are, that you know, we were talking about how adult things can be. Oh, yeah. And, um, and there were, on, on a couple of occasions, I was sort of forcing the family to watch it while we were eating, breaking the cardinal sin because we didn't let the TV. But, you know, the last 20 minutes overlapped. They probably would let me watch it. Um, but they, they didn't like two things. I started picking up my food and going, I don't like the look of this. And they be became convinced it was because I was seeing stuff 
on the TV that was putting me off my food. <laughs> and they felt I was in, encroaching on family time. And I'll never forget the day they went, you're not watching anymore. You know, you cannot watch it, this family time. And I would have grumped about it for a bit. And so, yeah, there was a whole chunk of episodes of Space 1999 that I never saw for a long time until it sort of came around in home video and DVD. Uh, so, yeah, so um, I, that was my ban. It was putting me off my food and interrupting Sunday lunch. Wow. Well, um, that feels very unfair. Yeah, rather than a punishment. It sounds like for Gary, it was like, that's your favourite TV show. You can't watch You're it. You're a naughty so, boy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you were banned. But you can watch no, it any time you like no. now. Well, yeah, and it was the schedule at Granada's fault. I mean, yeah. you know, you don't schedule it across Sunday lunch, do no. you? you know, foolish. So, yeah, foolish. Uh, I wouldn't have done that. But you um, can now watch but, it any time on ITV. Uh, thank you. There yes, you that's the great thing about streaming, isn't it? <laughs> Let's so, have another one, yeah. Greg. By the way, I think probably the other thing on that is I think your parents often don't know all the weird and wonderful sci-fi you watch. And it, probably they were watching it for the first time going, I don't want to watch this while I'm eating my lunch. And, yeah, you particularly know, Dragon's Domain with the uh, yeah microwave yeah. corpses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it might have been that episode. And I think back then they didn't edit them like you probably do today yeah, for daytime. So, yeah, Anyway, um, Alex Pass has sent this one the in. Gal. And it says, you can take any Anderson vehicle for a test drive, which one and why? And I think I've answered this previous, actually, because I, I, I love the mole. I just love the idea of yeah, you're being consistent. in it and sort of, you know, very simplistic. Down you go, up you come, and who knows where you come up. So, so that and, um, and, and also, uh, you know, any probably any one of the Thunderbird craft that would take you into to space. Although, this is not a vehicle, but and I know you're not, not the biggest fan of this franchise, but I loved Joe 90. And the, uh, you know, the it's not a vehicle, but the contraption that comes the big around rat. you. You know, the rat. Yes. You want to go in the big rat? Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love okay. to go in that. Who wouldn't? And, you know, it's sort of, well, yeah, I think you're in a minority there. It's just <laughs> like, you know, it's great fun. I'm not sure I agree. But okay, fine. I, I got this image of you bursting up through the lobby of, of ITV towers in the That's mole it. and climbing yeah. out. And people all, all the, the satellite dishes could keel outwards, just like the trees. Oh, it'd be yeah. amazing. Yeah, it'd be perfect. Okay, fine. I'll organise that for my next visit. You've got uh, two you. more questions. Right. Penultimate one. This is from Mark Perkins. He says, are there any plans to make the HD upscaled version of Space Precinct commercially available? And I can confidently say... Jamie will answer that question because <laughs> I'm, I'm in no way involved in any commercial releases. Well, I guess there's two, there's two aspects to that. One is, mm. will it make the transition from ITVX Premium to mm. ITVX Free? Yes. Yeah. And then will that happen at some point? I mean, that's up to you, not me yeah. or up to your yeah, team. Uh, it's highly likely. Yeah. yeah. We, like, we like to put stuff as a sort of treat, as a reward almost for people watching BritBox for a few years. Yeah. And then we have a discussion about actually now is there a wider audience? But, um, uh, and, and as I said, back to that earlier point, if you have thousands and thousands of hours of content, there's an optimum amount to have. Yeah. So if you bring something down, what, what do you take off? So, so I could see it at some point, but probably not in the next year or two. On ITVX. Fine. Over and as far as a commercial release goes more widely, it's absolutely something we're looking into. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. How's and why that? not? Yeah. Perfect. Last one. I mean, there's no surprises now. No, there's one in the bottom of the lunchbox from Paul Hyder. Paul Hyder in, chi in China. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. It's very international, this podcast, you know. Ah, yeah. Well, he's asking, what is it about ITVX that makes it a great home for Anderson shows? And I may have partially answered this before. I think it's two things. One is we've got a brand called BritBox, which celebrates the best of British TV. And Anderson shows absolutely the, embody the best of British TV. So why, why not? Um, I think it also helps that when it comes to the free part of ITVX, the bit which has ads in that you don't have to pay for, um, the older stuff we host there needs to make a bit of sense. So it tends to be ITV brands. So it's a legacy thing, right? This is bringing the best of what ITV has done in the past, be it Brideshead Revisited or Rising Damp or A Touch of Frost or Prime Suspect or Cracker or all of those classic shows. Um, I, I, it's brilliant to put it in there. It's great to have it in the mix. Because so many shows in the 60s were shot on videotape, black and white often, that, you know, I think if you're a true fan, and I do, mm. you go back and watch them. But if you want to get them to a wider audience, it is a little harder. So having stuff that's in HD, 
uh, either black and white or color really helps because, you know, you want to be a sort of premium streaming service. So I think we're a great home for the shows. I think sci-fi is a very big genre if you run a streaming service. Oh, yeah. um, so to have the gift of these shows is huge. And, and look, as I said earlier, um, I think for me... We've just got to pace ourselves. We don't want to release it all, all in one go. I know people would love that, but there are lots of practical considerations. But over time, we'd like to every year keep finding a new little tree, like Space Precinct on BritBox in HD. You know, all of the, you know, every year find something new to go, oh, now here's, here's something new to come back for. And while you're here, you can enjoy all these other shows yeah. as well. It is the perfect home. And we're very grateful that all the Anderson stuff has such a nice home. I absolutely love it. It's one of those areas where what you love... Um, and something that's been with you through your life sort of intersects with um, your job, and that's amazing. It's mm. a gift, but yeah, no. Um, uh, and just to reassure everybody, we we don't we don't take this lightly. We you know we care about these shows, and we want them to look better and better, and we want to add to them, build them out because um, it's a brilliant slice of classic British telly. So we've got to look after it for and sort of hand it on to the future generations. Please keep it up. Uh, now, Craig, there is a very special game which we're going to play just very shortly yeah the final iteration of i believe cute mute or recruit which i will give you some context for shortly <laughs> by the a, final one do you mean it's we're about to kill it yes you, you are uh, the executioner <laughs> yes. essentially yes um, kiss of death but we at the very start of our our first chat last week you you mentioned meeting a very young me mm. uh, and, and meeting dad i we sort of didn't really get into that no, that meeting in particular no. just wanted a bit more context for it to round off this yeah. sort of start to finish discussion. Honestly, um, Jerry was absolutely lovely actually to me. I was a young sort of jobbing DJ, and on more than one occasion, he would sometimes say, "Do you want me to do something on the show?" Or and so he came on several times actually, and um, he was he was really he was really nice guy. He was, he was I think he'd got to that stage where he was at peace with a lot of that legacy. Yes. So I think he was, I'm not sure, but I think he was finally comfortable talking about a lot of it for the first time. He was very mischievous. He would always throw, in, in the interviews, he would always throw something in to try and throw me. I think most famously <laughs> when he was talking about how he managed to get the effect of Robert the Robot, mm. um, uh, and which he did, of course, and innocent me on a networked Saturday morning show with many, many kids listening, he told the story of how uh, the ideal implement he found to press against his throat to get that... that uh, that voice and I had my head in my hands. He did it on purpose, I think. You could see what he was doing. So I love but I love that. There was there was always a good bit of banter. He always brought it to life and he was actually was very generous with his time. And and as I say, Simon Archer had introduced us. So um so yeah, so he was he was great when he came on the show and he told all the brilliant anecdotes that we know and love, you know, his hatred of, of John and that's why he stuck him in the space station and all of that. Now, I think people forget now, we take the internet for granted, but back in the early 90s, you were clinging on to a book or a magazine article or a radio interview to find out these nuggets. Now, I think everybody knows a lot of this stuff because it will be sitting there on a Wikipedia page yeah. somewhere. Um, but no, and the other thing I was very impressed at about Jerry was his drive. Mm. Every time you met him, he was talking about a new project. The there, next were, thing. there was yeah. always the next thing, always that that's what got him out of bed in the morning. Um, but as I say, I think he certainly said to me that for a time he sort of hated, sort of grew to resent and we all know this, obviously, uh, what he did in the 60s because he really wanted to be making live action and he got a bit boxed in. Um, but there was always projects on the go and, you know, they a lot of them eventually came to fruition, but it would take years, you know. Um, but that's what a great producer does. They don't, they don't give up. They just keep chipping away. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, as I say, we, we had some great times. It was, I felt incredibly... Uh, fortunate to be invited and to go backstage, um, albeit everybody was more interested in Pat Sharp than me, clearly, uh, legend, legendary 80s DJ Pat Sharp. Um, <laughs> but I was just couldn't believe I got to be there to mm. see some of the original, you know, uh, marionettes and stuff. It was amazing. There you go. And now here we are. All these yes, years later. all these years later, and it comes <laughs> it comes full circle because that's how old I am. I mean, that would have been like 30-odd years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. 
It's amazing. Scary. If you could have told young me and younger you then yes. that this would be what we do yeah. now. Anyway. Even even better. There's so much lovely full circle stuff that we talked about and including, you know, Dad's Army and that allowed me mm. and Dad to sit and watch stuff together yeah. and, you know, how it's affected your life. It feels only right that we should end on a real high <laughs> with a game of cute mute or recruit. Yeah, what a great way to sort of ruin that lovely poignant chat we were just having. It was also yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we can thank Richard James for um, yeah. creating this game. Yeah. Uh, now, <laughs> if you're not aware, uh, it's probably for the best, but um, each week, until now, the previous week's guest has drawn three random cards from a selection of characters uh, and you are now tasked with building your very own, or our very own, uh, international rescue type agency. So you right. can, you, you get these three choices. You can only recruit one. Right. You're going to say that one is cute. I mean, this is Richard's game. <laughs> and one you're going to mute because you couldn't bear uh, okay. any, any right. time okay. with them at all. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. And you're about to tell me. Well, I'm going to give you the three cards okay. and you can tell us who's here. I think you'll recognise all of them. God, so, so here are your choices, courtesy wrong. of Nicholas Young. Right, Who have you got, so Craig? I've got uh, Mr. Four Feather Falls. Tex Tucker from Four Tex Feather Tucker. Falls. Yes, exactly. Everybody's favourite, Parker Ooh. Butler. Interesting one. And um, UFO guy. Ed Straker. Ed Straker. Straker. Commander Thank Ed Straker. You. Yeah, Commander Ed Straker. This is quite... This is quite tough. Well, actually, there's an easy mute in these. Is there? Easy mute. Who are you muting? Tex Tucker. Goodbye, Tex. Tex oh, Tucker. Dear. I'm not a big Westerns fan, um, so I've never quite liked that. So, and, and Four Feather Falls is fine for what it is. I, do, I have watched some. Um, but no, sorry, Tex. I'm not big into the cowboy scene. So. Wow. So that's the voice of... Uh, entertainment legend Nicholas Parsons. I know. You've chosen to I know, mute. I know. Ouch. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, sorry. Yes, but that that one's going. Right. So, so that's down. It is Parker or Ed Straker. Who are you going to uh, say is cute, and who are you going to recruit cute. for your cute special organisation? I think you've made it very easy for me. The the well, cute and recruit. It's, it's Nicholas Young that's made it easy for you. I've had nothing to do with this <laughs> at all. Uh, I'm I'm recusing myself from any involvement with this. I think we've got to say cute. Because really, yeah, we've got to say cute. I'm shocked, but that's partly because I don't know whether I'd ever describe Parker as cute. He's, you know, he's, he's cute in a sort of quirky, charming. Way. No, 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 no. I, the thing I loved about UFO um, was the the look, the feel, the costumes, proper space age madness, which I love. The multicolored hair, and again, you know, uh, so I looked at that show and I felt everybody was quite, quite good looking and just, you know, so okay. Um, so there's a cuteness there, definitely right. uh, a type, I think. So, Very good. Yeah, I go for that. But and no, therefore... if I was going to build something around somebody and uh, build it out into something and start something up, I I'd want Parker at my side. This is this guy with his background. Uh, you know, I feel, you know, as we saw over many, many episodes, he's a man of hidden depths, murky depths as well, I think. Yes. You know. But I, I like that. I think you need a bit of rough and tumble. You need someone who can crack the code or, you know, he could probably take someone into an alleyway and, you know, look after himself <laughs> with his... <laughs> <laughs> in 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 terms of, I think he could get into a, a bit of a fight situ and he'd look after you. I think, you know. I mean, I would say Straker would too, but it's interesting. It says a lot about your psychology, Craig, that you would choose yeah. an ex-convict over someone previously ex in the US Air Force and now head of a secret organisation. Ex-convict, you can do, yeah. No, no, no. I, there's, it's Pretty Boy versus the Brawn. And I think, okay. you know, yeah, I think I'd want Parker in my corner. Well, what a bombshell to end Cute mute or recruit on. <laughs> I'm so glad that that's the way we've ended it. Goodness me. Uh, Craig, to redeem yourself, yes. is there anything else that you would like to add about ITVX or what people can watch? Is, is Uncharted coming up on X, I believe? I think, I'm sure. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's in plan. It's like um, one of the things I'm keen to do is look for uh, a moment, you know, like a, a Jerry Anderson day or if a show has a particular day. Mm. Uh, but yes, I, I'm not sure how widely known that is, but Uncharted will definitely be coming on to the free tier of ITVX uh, very soon, actually. Um, and yeah, we 
look, ITVX is there to just go in and watch what you want to watch. And as I say, over the next year, I'm quite ambitious that we'll make it more personalised to, to your taste. But um, particularly if you go for the premium subscription, you do get a lot of additional shows, a lot of great sci-fi shows. So I'll always be the salesperson for the whole thing. But what I like most about it is we can put all this stuff out there and it can find whole new audiences. We've just launched, um, you can put lots of channels up uh, within ITVX and we've just launched a blast from the past channel and that's showing things like you know Captain Scarlet and stuff so oh, so amazing. we're finding lots of places to put this it's there all of it's there you know to to watch in its entirety but we've got channels if you don't want to pick and uh, you'll you'll see that sandwiched in between rhubarb and custard and other classics so yeah so look there's a lot there to discover but it's got to be each to their own but I as, as you can probably tell I just feel incredibly privileged to be able to work there and pull it all together. I've got a brilliant team who work very hard on uh, curating the stuff and getting it in front of people. But all I'd say to people is go and have a nose around. There's some quite interesting stuff there that you might not have spotted before. Brilliant, Craig. Well, it's all in very good hands and we're very grateful, all Lander fans are, for everything you're doing there. So please keep it up. Uh, last week we talked about where to find ITVX, but what about people people want to find you? Can they follow you on LinkedIn or are you on Twitter? Or yeah, X, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not on any um, platforms, but LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn is always a place you can uh, look up sort of what I'm up to. Um, but yeah, you know, obviously I, I, what I love is actually you've got a, a great connection here with the people who love the world of Jerry Anderson. So as they've done today, never what I'd say is never be shy of asking the questions uh, to the team at Anderson Entertainment. And uh, you guys are very good at getting it across to us. And and no idea is a bad idea. I'm always looking for new ideas, new thoughts of what we could do to keep things fresh. As I say, the only thing with the streaming service is you don't want things to go stale. You don't just want to oh, put yeah. them there. So you always need to release new stuff. So that's why we keep our powder dry and hold shows back because, you know, what exciting things could we do next year mm. and the year after? Um, so, yeah, if anybody ever has any ideas, I'm always open to them. Amazing. Craig, you've been brilliant. Thank you so much. Is it Thank all? you, Craig Morris. Thank you. There, Craig Morris says goodbye. Still a nice man. Well, Always will be. What? Well, I say says goodbye. He's, he's going to pop back. He's got another little Chris's job to do to thing. press Chris's button. The randomizer coming up shortly. Yeah. yeah. But what an interesting take on the worlds of Jerry Anderson from someone really very deeply embedded in the industry at the moment, but mm. still sees that there's a place for the work of Jerry Anderson. Yes. Is it nice? It's nice Christmas. to have the support of people like Craig. Yeah, that's so, right. Thank you, Craig. I mean, all sorts of streamers seem to be falling over themselves at the moment to show Jerry Anderson shows, don't they? They do. Mm. Who knows where Space where Precinct might, might turn up next? <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yes. Uh, the bargain bin in the local. No, book, no, 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 no. Great. Next week, we've got Sadie Miller joining us. Ah. Uh, voice actor, writer. Uh, of course, the two of you uh, shared a screen together for uh, more than 30 years in the TARDIS. Uh, we, uh, we, 30 was, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it must be. It is 30 <gasps> years ago. Crikey. There yes, you go. when we were both wee nippers. Yes, that's right. Uh, so uh, she'll be joining us uh, next week to tell us all about her career and Anderson. Amazing. Well. That's so weird that I've been on that with her, never met her then. I've worked with her since directing her, <laughs> never met her in person. And now, <laughs> finally... My... You still don't get to meet her because I'll be interviewing her. Oh. You can have a fish finger sandwich with her for lunch. If you like. Brilliant. I look forward to that. <laughs> Great. Uh, now, over on our YouTube channel, oh, there's all sorts going on over there. Not only can you find uh, the weekly podcasts uploaded in video format. Brilliant. But you can also find, oh, there's a new documentary about uh, Jerry's early life and career, which is yep. fascinating. Correct. Uh, there's the uh, the primers, of course, mm. um, to introduce you to a new yeah. Jerry Anderson yes. series that you fancy. I think, are they all up? For yes. every series? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, there's also... Uh, documentaries, episodes, Beyond, Beyond Anderson, yeah. audio drama yeah. things, <sighs> trailers galore. Crikey. Parodies, no. pastiches, homages. Yes. Homages. But, uh, motion comics. Uh, all right. Oh, sorry. Finished? Yes. Okay. Now, I don't know if you remember Pod 280... I uh, do. Featured an interview with Alan Dean. Yes. Who has recently curated a book of fantastic pictures from uh, Candy and Andy and the Bear Anders. Very weird, but very lovely. Uh, conducted in my kitchen, you might have noticed. The, the interview, not the curating yeah. of the book. <laughs> yeah, that's Just right. To be clear. Yes, hence the rather dodgy sound, for which I apologise. But no one mentioned it. Did they not? No. I thought I did. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, what I mean is no one who's watched it. No one who matters. Gone, no, that's yeah, right. Okay. Scofair5551 yes. did, however, comment, the Candy and Andy era was Jerry Anderson at his most bizarre. Mm. 
Probably. Uh, it may have been uh, equally enigmatic had it been made into a series. Yep. It was definitely surreal by nature. Some may even think hallucinogenic influences, but I doubt that. I don't think so, no. <laughs> It was Jerry being original, heavily influenced by mid-60s psychedelia. And maybe the fact it didn't become a show aids my imagination on the characters to this day. I still believe it to be a charming concept. Charming certainly one word. It's true, it is. Is it charming? Yes. Sort of sinister. Sinister and charming. Certainly through a model lens, it's sinister. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Peter Lippmann, who we know and love, says, I wonder what an actual series this might have turned out to be. Candy, not the podcast, mm. he says. Well, because the podcast is a series. It is, yes. It's on IMDb. That's right. And Ian Dealey says, I'm really quite fascinated by the Candy and Andy story. The fact that it crossed over with Thunderbirds was an amazing achievement in itself. Yes, all happening at the same time. Yeah. And it pro probably across the studio floor from one another at various points. Just Weird. Just absolutely bizarre. Yeah. Uh, over on the early life of Jerry Anderson <sighs> on the videos about Lionel, yes. his big brother. Yes, fascinating, yeah. Uh, Mark Clory 007. Fascinating. Yeah, it says, very touching. Wasn't expecting that. Thank you and RIP to both of those amazing men. Yeah. Yes, it is a very touching insight if you haven't mm. watched it already. Mm. Uh, Dog Walker 666. Yeah, right. <laughs> wow. Oh, brilliant. Careful. Interesting. Said, fascinating documentary. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. uh, and Kilted Green. Yeah. Said, I feel so sad that Jerry thought that way, saying that he should have died rather than Lionel. Oh, yes. Uh, from his perspective, I can sort of see where he's coming from. But the joy that Jerry brought to the world through his work would have never happened if his wish had come true. Well, that's absolutely true. And, and probably, you know, if Lionel had survived the war, he might not have been inspired to go and do those things. If Ooh, You know, so, right. much, so much of his career is down to Lionel, really. Yeah. And, and if you uh, haven't seen it, mm. you can watch more and learn more about that on Jerry Anderson Life Uncharted, which yes, is now available uh, for free on ITVX. Oh, is it? Yes. Ah, from, okay. Well, from the 30th of November, which okay. is kind of now, isn't it? Kind of it? now, I think, yes. Yeah. Uh, so does that mean you don't have to subscribe and be a sort of a premium member? Yeah, you can, you just... can just watch oh. the ad interrupted version. Oh, right, yeah. okay. Might have a look at that. I mean, I've seen it before, obviously. Might have another look. Uh, great. And now, uh, I also, I mean, this is something we teased last week. Oh, yeah. I never got around to mentioning. Yes, I was but, too I mean, excited. It's been, it, it's been in full view for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, but this is the release of the Space 1999 Eagle Collectibles. Oh, bash me mind. Careful. There. Look I'm, fl that. I'm flying it around for those of okay. you listening. Yeah, well, setlick 3 gaming 80 uh, commented beneath the video, uh, letting us know that these collectibles were available for pre-order, saying, I'll oh, check it out. I was raised on a farm, and I used old pots and pans and stuff around the ranch to build my own Moonbase Alpha. Amazing. Uh, I would step around it, flying my model eagle in my hand, landing and sometimes crashing, of course, course on the moon's surface. I would create aliens using other models and imagined all the drama unfolding beneath those hoses and pots and pans and blocks of wood. Space 1999 will always have that special place in my heart of imagination. Oh, how lovely. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? And uh, so, yeah, here it is. You get your own, uh, your own Space 1999 Eagle. Look yes. And, but also, thing. well, actually, do you want to read the other comment? And then Tom I'll... Senior 7405 simply says, want, 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 want. Want. Glad you read all of them. I was worried you were going to drop them there. <laughs> so the other thing that we revealed, and we spoke about in the news a couple yep. of weeks ago, but we haven't really talked about since, <sighs> it's hidden away here, our new Thunderbird 2, desktop Beautiful. Thunderbird 2 collectible that's coming. The, so the prototype that I've got here yep. um, has not got the finished paint job. It's yep. only got a little bit of weathering on it, but it is glorious. And I've wanted one of these for so long. I've just wanted us to do a lovely Thunderbird 2 that can sit on display and yeah, just be something you could marvel right, at. And it yeah. is... It is a beauty. Great. So that's, that's coming next year. Is it? Mm. Lovely. Just Very generally. nice. Oh, and it's got it. So does it come with this little sort of runway? It comes runway? with this little runway. Oh, just hold that. We're up not up. doing QVC, Richard. No, I, just... know, I know, but people want to see it, don't they? Well, they can't see it if they're hearing it, but yes, it's on a runway stand. <laughs> Anyway, goodness me, <laughs> shall we move on? Yes, uh, well, that's all for now over on our YouTube channel, but uh, yeah, do give it a visit and give it a comment, and um, uh, we'll read out your comments next time. Also, while we're talking about commenting, you mentioned IMDb earlier. I did. Well, now we're on video, yes. as you mentioned. The, 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 the podcast now has its own entry. IMDb listing, yes. Uh, I mean, does that mean that's part of my uh, IMDb? It does, yeah. Does it? Yeah. I'll well, have to have a look. Yeah. So please uh, do go, go along and rate that. Yes, uh, somewhere else to put a, a rating and a review. Yeah. Um, We'd love that. Yeah, great. Uh, right, that, that's it, I think, from us for now. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, thank goodness we've made it this far, which means we can now hand over the reins to someone far more competent. Oh, yes. It's Chris Dale and the Randomizer. He's very good. Shall we? Mm. Over to you, Chris. Well, Craig, once more, I find you on the Randomizer sofa with myself and the Randomizer. You know the form, you know how this works, so whenever you're ready, Let's press the button. Yeah, I wanted Stingray last week. We got you, UFO, you but yes. so let's we can better UFO. You know, there's can't 18 we? shows in yeah, here. Yeah, come on, let's. Got to be. It's got to be better, right? Oh, 
anything. Better, better than... There's only one thing you know, yeah. that we really don't want yeah. to see come yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. Oh, oh. That one thing wouldn't be Torchy the Battery Boy, would it? We invite you here, okay. we give you a nice I lunch. Just, just press Lovely questions. All I did was press a button. Just, 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 just. It's fine, it's fine. You're, it's only 10 minutes. You're not a fan? You're not a fan? I'm not really a fan, no. No, no. Not right. many people know that, but uh, you know, I've soldiered through 80 million of them by this point, so what's one more, right? Well, enjoy it. Yes, I will. You can clear off. You've done your bit, honestly. I must be past the halfway point with these, but they keep coming, like cockroaches. But it's true, what, you know, what I said to Craig there, you, you invite the guests onto the Jerry Anderson podcast, you give them a nice lunch, and this, they go and do this to you. I mean, I, mean I, I felt that I was getting on all right with Craig, and then it's just this sort of, what does he do? He goes and lays, King Dithers loses his crown on me. Uh, King Dithers, I don't know, loses his crown as a disgusting creature, possibly, I don't know. I'm sure you've never seen an orange peel palace before. Uh, yeah, I have. I saw it in the episode King Dithers, actually. Can I go now? No? The king of Topsy Turvy Land yes. is called Dithers. King Dithers, yes. And there he is in his throne. There he is, I can Dithering see Dithering around as uh, usual. If you could just hold shot, I, I can get him. No, <laughs> no, he's moving. Save it for torture later on. I wonder on. what I shall do with myself today. Oh, I don't know. I'm all of a dither. <laughs> don't want to do that. I've only just got up. <laughs> well, don't sing. Don't sing. It's too early for a song. No, I think I'll go to Fruit Town and see how Torchy the Battery Boy is getting on. <laughs> I'll go and spread my uh, my unpleasant presence upon my innocent... Uh, Subjects. I mean, I must dust my comb and, and, and have my velvet... Uh, 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 have an aneurysm. What's going on? Oh. Oh, dear. My crown's fallen off. Well, it seems too large for me today. That Maybe surely can't be the uh, instigating, inciting uh, uh, in, uh, uh, event of the episode, Where's my coach and donkey? Coach and donkey? Oh, yes, Daffy, Daffy, Daffy Donkey. Daffy. Uh, and there he is. The donkey was harnessed to King Dither's coach. At all times, 24-7. It was a hellish existence. I wonder why King Dither is calling me. Ah. <laughs> Hello, Daffy. Uh, I want you to take me to Fruitown. Of course, Your Majesty. He's left his uh, crown at the palace, you see. Do you know where it is? I hope this doesn't descend into he's out visiting people and he doesn't know where his crown is and then it turns out that he left it back at the palace because I will be cross. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear it. <laughs> uh -huh. Now I'll climb into the coach uh, yep. and we can be off. Good, good, King good. Dithers climbed into his coach and Daffy began to... <laughs> he's dead. Oh no, his eyes are shut. Trick trot, trick trot, oh, went the that's dog. actually quite good puppet walk for this show. Uh, this is a fairly ambitious shot for this series, you know, fair's fair. Uh, but soon, Daffy began to feel tired. Hmm. And suddenly, he stopped walking. Oh, <laughs> sat down. There's the one tooth hanging out the front of the mouth. I find that quite disturbing. I'm tired of pulling the coach. Hmm. I want to have a rest. Wake up, Your Majesty. It's time for you to pull the coach. Fruit Town is not far away, and you'll have to walk there. <laughs> well, well yeah. nonsense. I'm not going to walk to Fruit Town. Now, take me all the way there. Oh, come on, you're the royal donkey. It's literally your only job in the series. I'm too hot, and I want to rest now. <sighs> what an obstinate donkey you are. Um. Oh, well. Wasn't there a crown in this episode that's supposed to be getting lost? No. Torchy was cleaning the windows of his pineapple house uh. when King Dithers tiptoed up behind him. It looks like he's got someone trapped in the house and he's going, You can't escape from me. I am Torchy and I will always be with you. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm very absent-minded, you know. Mm. And I, uh, I, I sometimes forget things. I yeah. know you do. You've forgotten something very important today. Oh, oh. Have I really? 
Your pants! Oh dear. Well, never mind. The kingdom doesn't fall apart because the king isn't wearing the crown. Yes, he did, he did. We saw it fall off his head. So there's no mystery here. Unless Daffy has stolen it and has taken the throne for himself. And then you can walk back, because I'm not sending the donkey out again just for you. I'll go and fetch him at once. Squish, oh. the space boy with a water pistol, yes, was having a swing in the him. playground. Oh, gee, I don't know what to Whoa, do Whoa, careful, thing. Torchy. Don't walk out in front of the swing, Torchy. I wouldn't want you to get hurt. Oh, brother. That would be Oh, super. brother, it's Torchy. I always wanted to have tea in a palace. Come on, then. <laughs> King Dithers and Torchy. Oh, the poor donkey now has to go back with three people rather than just one. He didn't like pulling such a heavy coach. No. And they went very slowly. Much like the story. But at last they reached the palace uh -huh. and went into the throne room. Squish is doing no. some strange Help poses. Help me find my crown and then we'll have tea. Oh, dear, dear. Oh, now where is it? <sighs> I can't see it anywhere. Mm. Neither can I. I guess you've lost it. Oh, oh well, never mind. We've got to find it. Torchy, you must help me find my crown. All right. I'll ask my magic beam to help me. Okay. Magic beam magic time. Beam that it is, is so bright. bright. Will you shine, shine your lovely light? light? Idiot king lost his crown. Magic beam round and round and round and round. Now and I'll press and the switch the... on my jacket and my beam will tell us the answer. Oh, it's all right. I found it. I flushed it down the toilet. And it shone out of the throne room and all the way to a beautiful green bush. Uh-huh. All the places where we know the crown is. We'd better isn't. go and look under that bush, Your Majesty. My beam says that's where you'll find your crown. Uh, how reliable is this beam of yours, Torchy? <laughs> My head feels cold without a crown. Hmm. Well. Oh, no, OK. Yes, that's quite a uh, disturbing shape in the background. I think we're about to get another reveal of a character for the first time. Uh, it's the bird thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, there he is. Uh, what a funny-looking thing. It's not a penguin, and it's, no, it's not, not a, a pelican. I think it's meant to be some kind of bird, but I couldn't swear as to which. There's only one of them in the world. Hmm. Can you talk? Well, you kind of. <laughs> I'm I mean, sure you could yeah. speak if you opened your beak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Torchy would be a great speech therapist, wouldn't he? I'm sure you can speak. Just, just say words. It's fine. It's very easy. I do wish he would talk to me. Uh, I'm sure he must have a very funny voice. I know what I'll do. There's enough people in Topsy Turvy Land with funny voices. We don't need any more. What happened to the giggling hyena? The um, uh, spinning top with the moustache. Does he have the crown? What's going on? Walking one way, walking the other way. We're not building up to a song, are we? Oh, do stop walking up and down. Yes, yes, very. I've found some grass and I'm going to tickle you and make you laugh. Oh, Did don't do that, that, don't do that. <laughs> We're not bringing tickling into this. I think he's going to have the crown in his mouth. He's laughing, King Dithers. Listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Pillywig the clown is just off screen crying, Oh, they didn't bring me in to make him laugh. That's my only reason for existing. There's the stupid crown. Well, I never. Oh, I, I did. found your crown. That means I am now king of Topsy Turvy Land. All bow before me. I don't think the pelican's going to open his beak. Oh, it's a pelican. Okay. I'll find a pair of pincers and make him open it. <laughs> Come on, pelican. Uh, well, um, open your yeah, beak and give me my crown. Otherwise, Torchy is going to implement violent methods, and uh, we don't want that. Oh, I didn't steal it. I found it. 
Mm. I love all things that shine and glitter. But this is Kenneth Connor as well, and I think also he was playing the donkey. So Kenneth Connor does a lot of talking to himself in this show. Have a look. As he does in Four for the Fall. Ah. Uh. Oh. <gasps> well, I never. <laughs> it's covered in stomach acid. What have you been doing with it? You'll get indigestion if you swallow all those. I don't swallow them. I keep them in my beak. Yes. And take them out and look at them. We know. We've established this. Can this be well, over? You're not going to keep my crown. I For an episode called King Dithers Loses His Crown, we seem to have found the crown about halfway through. Ooh! Ooh! Ah. Oh, He's bitten the king's hand. <laughs> uh, punishable by death, <laughs> possibly? <my> fingers. <laughs> oh, uh, come uh, on, uh, get on uh, with it. Uh, I'm very sorry, but I love your crown. And Please I love you. let me keep it in my beak. <laughs> I'll look after it very carefully for you. So which kid on earth had the disturbing pelican toy in suit toy? Uh, in fact, it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, <laughs> you I can suppose. live with me and go around picking up all the things I lose. Oh, oh no, no, I'm not going to go that far. I know I am. I'm not sure who's coming off more sinister here. Oh, what aside else? from the fact that he's now singing, actually from a distance, he does look quite sinister. He looks a, he looks a bit like uh, Uncle Deadly from The Muppets, from a distance. Close up, he, he looks all right, although the tiny hands are a bit disturbing. Yes. Torchy is about to jump on him with the pliers. No time for a song. I want that crown back. Mini mini ma, here we go again. I'm Polycon. Clever Polycon. Whatever you can do, Polycon. Yes. I'm very ugly. Yes, you are. I yes. Admit. Yes. When I stand, I look. <laughs> don't come any closer. I, I, I don't... Having the crown in the mouth, it makes the mouth look very sinister, like almost like there's a tongue in there or something. I've never really cottoned on to the sinisterness of this puppet before. I think also the, the very thin eye, uh, it, arm joints don't help. You needn't bother with that, Torchy. Can't you see? We, we've come to an arrangement, Torchy. It's unorthodox, but I think it will work. So you have. How did you get it? Ah, 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 The Pollican and I are friends, yes. <laughs> and he's coming to live with me. <laughs> I won't lose my crown or jewels anymore, because when I take them off, he will just pop them into his beak. <laughs> <laughs> what a good idea. Well, we it's an idea. Yeah, uh, whatever, have whatever, just end. You've ended, thank you. Right, well, that was uh, King Dithers uh, does something stupid. Oh, loses his crown and then finds it again and spends more than half the episode dilly dallying about with the stupid pelican thing. I feel like I've run a marathon after watching some of these. And they're only 10 minutes, not even that. Um, what can I say? You know, this is perfectly fine. Uh, addition to the, the Torchy saga. Um, you know, I, I mean, you saw, you saw what happened. You make up your own minds. I'm, I'm, forget you guys, I'm out of here. Later. Torchy. <sighs> What? Torchy! Uh, yeah, but it has its place, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you where it might have its place next year. Right. <laughs> it's going to be terrible <laughs> because I've forgotten the name of the lovely group who are doing it. We'll remember in a future week. Great. Uh, there's a group of modellers that I met at Scale Model World. Yes. And each year they have a theme. Next year their theme is Jerry Anderson. Ah. And next year they intend to do a scale model of... Yeah. Torchy's Rocket. Ah, <laughs> lovely. Not just that, a load of yeah. other stuff too. Oh, great. That's so really they'll be nice. showing that off at Scale Model World 2024. Right. Mm. That's what a fantastic idea. Do they have themes every year then? Yes, I don't know what the theme was this year. Sure. But the, the great, because next year's theme is Jerry Anderson and yeah. the year after it's Thunderbirds. 
Oh, well, right. So Double bubble. Great draw for Anderson fans for Scale right. Model World next year and the year after. Yeah. Anyway, yes. Good. Thanks, Chris, for Torchy. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there'll be something else next week, won't there? Yeah, it could something be another Torchy because it's random. Could be another Torchy. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Be like flicking tails twice, wouldn't it? Yes. Could happen. Which is, is very likely. Or even three times or four times. It's it, just yeah, as likely. Except it's a, it's a coin with hundreds of heads on it. Yes. Than, or hundreds, hundreds of faces on it. Yes. Anyway, let's move on. This is getting <laughs> I know. Yeah. All right. Well, we're, all we've got left is to say goodbye. So. Yes. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye. Thanks, oh, Postrons. Bye to Chris. Bye to you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Postrons. Bye. 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 Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. Do you know I had a dream yes, last right. night Did you? about doing uh, a live podcast? Right. And the podstroms were so unruly. <laughs> you know, when you do it, you ho- you do your wonderful hosting and you, you run around the, the room. The Bruce you- Forsyth thing, yes. Well, I was going to say Annika Rice. But oh, no, I'll take that. You know yes, I mean, I you're sort that. of the love child of Annika Rice and Bruce Forsyth. It's Actually, been before. Na- yeah. Now you, I can now really see it. it. Anyway, I'm my love. Yeah. <laughs> When you do it in your yeah. jumpsuit yeah. and you run around the audience and you, you encourage them to say news, 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 yes, and gubbins, gubbins and- they were just doing it. They were running amok through yeah, the podcast. They? We were trying to say, oh. uh, you know, uh, uh, coming up now, some news uh, from the yeah. world of Jerry Anson. Yeah. And they just and they were all- shouting, news, 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 oh. news, like heckling us with their own catchphrases. That's that willow. Yeah, watch her. terror, mm, terror. Isn't she? But yeah, I, they never do that really. It's just the enthusiasm. But I don't know why I had a... Why did I have an anxiety dream about a live podcast? Is that a bit weird? Let's talk about this when we say goodbye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. So, tell me about your childhood. (laughs) That was an Anderson Entertainment production. Rude. Fascinating. Brilliant.